Welcome to lesson number four in the series called I Believe, which is a study of the Apostles' Creed. This lesson, today we look at the Holy Spirit. Now, as I've mentioned in previous lessons, there was a lot of attention concerning the descriptions of God the Father and God the Son, and particularly the humanity and divinity of Jesus. And, uh, and in this creed, there's only one statement about the Holy Spirit, even though the Holy Spirit is a co-equal part of the Trinity. Well, why is there just one statement that simply says, I believe in the Holy Spirit? Now, this is what I'm about to offer you, I think is kind of a hunch or it's kind of my best guess based on things that I've, that I've read. I've never seen it specifically mentioned this way, um, is that around the time the creed was formulated, there were a many, many more arguments about the interrelation of the Father to the Son and the nature of the Son, the nature of Jesus and who he was, uh, then there were questions and debates about the Holy Spirit. It's not that they weren't around, but the, but the things related to specifically the, the nature of Christ uh, was particularly important. So, uh, the and, and just kind of as an aside, the same type of discussions were going on not only in the formation of the Apostles' Creed, but then the formation of the Nicene Creed, which is another historic affirmation of faith. Well, since much of the Apostles' Creed addresses heresies of the day that were so popular, uh, my, my guess is just that the council didn't see the need to spend a lot of time on the nature of the Holy Spirit. Now, there's one quick aside that I want to offer to you that related to the Nicene Creed uh, that, uh, that does say a little bit more uh, about, uh, about the Holy Spirit, and I think maybe that's because uh, later on, there were questions that came up about the Holy Spirit and the nature of the Holy Spirit and who this Holy Spirit is and the role and activity of the Spirit. And so by the time of the Nicene Creed, which wasn't too much later, but it was a little bit later, the Nicene Creed, just by comparison, the Apostles' Creed says, I believe, we believe in the Holy Spirit. The Nicene Creed has this word to say about the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. Some of the more modern creeds, by and large, uh, talk more about the Holy Spirit as well. As we are, seek to understand and make a more definitive statement than the Apostles' Creed does, about the Holy Spirit and the role of the Holy Spirit in the interrelation of the Spirit to the Father and the Son and, and how that activates and works in our Christian faith. In 1 Corinthians 12, verses 1 through 4, Paul talks about the Spirit and the gifts of the Spirit and the relationship to the church as the body of Christ. But he begins in talking about the Spirit there by acknowledging that there were those who were putting extreme emphasis on the Holy Spirit some going so far even as to say, let Christ be cursed. And this is what he says in, in 1 Corinthians 12, 1 to 4. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were enticed and led astray to idols that could not speak. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking by the Spirit of God ever says, let Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. So it's not that there weren't, weren't any discussions or there wasn't any misunderstanding at all. We can see from Paul's letter to Corinth and from other places that even in the early church, there were questions about the Spirit and relationship of the Father to the Son. Uh, and in fact, Paul notes there that no one by the Spirit of God would say, let Jesus be cursed. But he also says that it's only by the strength and inspiration of the Spirit that someone can say Jesus is Lord because the Spirit affirms and glorifies and edifies Christ. So far from uh, diminishing Christ, he was saying the Spirit edifies Christ. And, and so it's not, again, that there weren't any discussions about the Holy Spirit. It's just that wasn't the main thrust of the Apostles' Creed. Having said all of that, I want us to spend a little more time by using this lesson to talk more specifically about the Holy Spirit because I think it's important that we understand that. Uh, just as an aside, I have a five-part series that I have done on the Holy Spirit 
that uh, you're welcome to look at and that goes more in depth. And in some ways, this lesson today is kind of a recap and maybe kind of a, a, a condensing of the major points of, of that lesson. But if you're interested in learning more or my understanding of the Holy Spirit, then I invite you to, to check those out. There are five lessons in that as well. So let's start just with a definition of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third person in the, of the Trinity, the Trinity being God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is co-eternal with God, which means that the Spirit, like the Father and the Son, has always been, has always existed. We call the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit the Trinity. We believe that each one of these persons is at the same time distinct and personal, totally individual, totally separate, and but also at the same time one, that all three of them together are one as well as being separate and distinct. Now, how this is possible is a mystery of faith. You know, it's not, it doesn't have to do anything to do with our biological laws or the, or the governing laws of the universe itself. God's above that, those things. And so it's a mystery of faith which we accept as a reality of who God is. And it comes out of understanding of Scripture and trying to look at the different ways that Scripture talks about the Spirit acting and working and the different relationships that the Spirit has to God the Father and God the Son. And I kind of want to emphasize this point pretty strongly about the Trinity and about the Holy Spirit because it is one of the common beliefs among the major Christian denominations or what we would call the Trinitarian denominations. And those are the denominations like Catholic, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Episcopal, uh, UCC, um, uh, ones along those lines. These are what we call Trinitarian denominations. And while we may have differences in other areas, we affirm the distinctiveness and yet at the same time the unity of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. There are other groups that use the term Christian and use the name Christian who do not talk about uh, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, do not talk about God the Father, or they have a different understanding of who Jesus is or a different understanding of the Holy Spirit. Uh, they are not what we would call Trinitarian. It's important to understand those distinctions. Uh, these different groups, as I said, have a different understanding uh, of the Holy Spirit, of Christ, of God the Father. And in our understanding and understanding of these Trinitarian denominations, the Holy Spirit works in perfect harmony and unity with the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit is separate and yet one, and the Spirit is eternal just as the Father and the Son are eternal. The Holy Spirit, in other words, is present in the beginning with the Father and the Son. And there are many references in the Old Testament to the activity the Holy, of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the very first time that the Holy Spirit is even mentioned is at the very beginning in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, where the writer of Genesis says, The earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of the deep, while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. And your translation of whatever Bible you use, I use the New Revised Standard, your translation may say, while the Spirit of God swept or hovered over the face of the waters. Uh, that, that word that the New Revised Standard translates as wind, but others translate as spirit, the reason they do that is because in the Hebrew, uh, the word for wind, spirit, and breath, and this is true in the Greek also, in the Hebrew, the word for wind, spirit, and breath is the same. It's ruach. And, uh, and, and it says something to us. And later on, the, the Greek word is pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A, or as we would transliterate it. And, and so later on, even when John, when Paul, excuse me, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus as recorded in the Gospel of John, a lot of names there, when he's doing that, um, he even says at one point, the wind blows and we don't see it. He's talking about and referring really not to just the general wind. He's making a reference to the blowing wind of the Spirit. So the scripture affirms the eternal nature and presence of Christ, that before God spoke the universe into existence, the Spirit was present right there with the Father and with the Son. 
There are a couple other uh, areas in scriptures, and there are a bunch of them, but I'm just going to mention a few. Judges 14.6 mentions the Spirit of the Lord being present with Samson, and a lion roars at Samson. And this is what Judges 14.6 says. The Spirit of the Lord rushed on him, and he tore the lion apart barehanded as one might tear apart a young goat. So in this instance, we see the spirit in an individual setting and in a temporary setting rushing in like a wind, giving what is needed for Samson at that moment and then giving Samson the strength that he needs. In the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit is present with rulers, but the Holy Spirit also leaves rulers. In 1 Samuel 16, 13, Saul anoints David and uh, and anoints him as a new ruler of Israel, even though Saul at the time is still king. As Samuel anointed David, the scripture says, quote, that the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. And in the very next verse, in verse 14, it says, now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul. So you see the spirit in the Old Testament, we see the Spirit giving wisdom, authority is needed. The Spirit comes upon that person who is the, the ruler chosen by God, and then, but then the Spirit leaves when there are those who are disobedient to God. If we move on forward uh, to, uh, well, and, and, and in the book of Joel, uh, which is quoted by Peter on the day of Pentecost, the, the book of Joel talks about, in those days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, upon all people. In other words, it's not going to be just the spirit lands upon this person for that moment in time or for that period of time where the spirit works over here in this instance. He says, I'll pour out my spirit upon all people. And Peter saw, and we see that the day of Pentecost is a fulfillment of that pouring out upon those young men and those old men who, who uh, dream dreams, have visions and dream dreams. In, in the book of Psalms, there are a couple of mentions where uh, the Spirit is, uh, is referenced as well. In Psalm 5111, the Psalm 51 being the, the Psalm of lament and confession that, or the Psalm of confession that David made to God after he committed the sin with Bathsheba and all the other sins that accompanied it. At one point, David, remember David who in 1 Samuel, it had said the Spirit of the Lord came and rested upon him. David in this Psalm of confession says, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. So David is recognizing that. He saw that happen in that lack of faith with Saul. So David is pleading and praying to God. Um, in, uh, and, and there are many other passages in the Psalms as well. And I could spend really the rest of the time going through just Old Testament passages. But I also want to look then at the New Testament and particularly at the Gospels. In the Gospel of John chapter 14, Jesus tells the disciples he's going away. But then he says that the Father will send an advocate, the Holy Spirit, to be with them and to teach them, to remind them of all that Jesus has taught them. In Matthew 28, 20, Jesus says, I will be with you even to the end of the age. And the, ways in which, and the way in which he is with us is through his being seated at the right hand of God, but also through, uh, as part of the Trinity, but also through that ongoing presence of the Holy Spirit where he talks about the advocate and the comforter who will come, that Jesus leaves and the Holy Spirit uh, comes in a new way and manifests in a new way there on that day of, of Pentecost. And so it's so some people will say, well, you know, the Holy Spirit first appeared at Pentecost. No, we see in Genesis the Spirit is present from the very beginning, and the Spirit is present in these uh, scripture passages I mentioned and many, many others in the Old Testament. But it is the case that from the day of Pentecost forward, we see the Spirit present in a new type of relationship uh, in interceding with us uh, between us and God and being present in us. So instead of it just being a one-time or a temporary or only on select people, that prophecy from Joel comes forward, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh and not just Jewish people but Gentiles as well. You see, once Jesus ascended and, and, and his physical presence was not here anymore, he then sends the spirit to be that active living presence of Christ in the world. The Holy Spirit is the presence of God, the presence of God active in this world and within our lives, within our hearts, within our spirits and souls, who guides us and inspires us and strengthens us, who gives us joy, gives us peace and comfort and hope. 
So we see that and we see in the book of Acts the ways that the Spirit speaks to Paul and guides Paul even where to go. We see in Acts chapter 10 the Holy Spirit being poured out upon Gentiles and in the early church the very first major, major debate about the direction of the church that we see in Acts 15 came about because in Acts 10, uh, Luke records where the Holy Spirit came upon those Gentiles and Peter and the others who saw this happen said, well, if the Holy Spirit has come upon the Gentiles, who are we to deny them that and who are we to deny them baptism? And so we have this back and forth about who's in and who's out. And But we see the affirmation of the, of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit truly being poured out upon people. When we look at the Holy Spirit and specific nature and characteristics of the Spirit then that we see in scriptures, um, there, there are several different things. And the first thing is to mention is that the Holy Spirit is a person. The Holy Spirit is unique. The Holy Spirit is an individual. In his book on the Holy Spirit, a man by the name of Jack Contrell puts it this way, and this is a quote. We may think of a person as a being who has rational consciousness self-consciousness, self-determination, and relationships with other persons. I think that's a pretty good definition of a person and how the spirit is a person. Well, rational consciousness is that which in which one thinks and acts beyond mere emotion or instinct. In other words, the spirit is strategic. The spirit determines where the spirit will go. The spirit allots as the spirit chooses. The spirit gives different spiritual gifts to different people in different measure as the spirit chooses. The self-consciousness, it means an awareness of oneself. And of course, the spirit is that as well. There is uh, that relational aspect as well, you see. The Spirit determines. And this relational aspect of the Spirit as a person where the Holy Spirit interacts with you and me, interacts in our lives each and every day, interacts in a broader context in the world to be sure, but in our individual lives of faith as well. And it's important, I think, and, and the reason I take the, to bring that up is because I think it's important to think about the Spirit in this way, in a relational aspect and how the Spirit relates to us and moves in our lives. Because otherwise, I think we can make the work of the Holy Spirit so kind of mysterious and ethereal and kind of, kind of out there uh, that we forget that the Spirit is active and, and working in a direct manner in your life and in mine, in rational, in strategic, and, and, and also in uh, practical ways in which the Spirit is working. You see, because, because before we were aware of anything, at the very earliest point of our being, we know that we were surrounded by the love of God. You formed my inward parts. You know, you knew me before I was born. And God, we believe, at least in our United Methodist Wesleyan understanding, we believe that from the very earliest point of our being, that God is working through the Holy Spirit in ways we don't fully understand, to offer us his grace, that unmerited, unearned, free gift of God's love and presence. We don't understand how that works, but we trust that, that God is working and present in our lives from the very beginning of our existence, that God claims us as his own, and God wants us eventually to uh, claim him in return. In our, in our Wesleyan terminology, going back to the founder of, Meth of the Methodist movement, John Wesley, we use the term prevenient grace, Preveni uh, mean to go the grace that goes before. It's the grace of God present and that we experience in our lives even before we are aware that there is such a thing as God or such a thing as the Holy Spirit. But we believe that the Spirit is working in our lives to bring us to that point of awareness of our sin, awareness of our need for forgiveness, awareness of who Jesus Christ is and what it is that Christ has done for us, and then leading us to that point of accepting Christ as Savior and Lord. We believe that God is working in what we would call his prevenient grace, his grace that goes before us. It's that phrase, it's that reminder uh, that before we loved God, God first loved us, as recorded in 1 John 4, 19. Before we loved God, God first loved us. He was present with us. God didn't wait for us to say, hey, God, I want to be a part of what you're doing. No, God loved us first, and it's because God has loved us and done everything first that we have the opportunity to love God in return. That's what we would call God's prevenient grace. But, of course, as we will grow in our walk with God, we become not only more aware of God's love, but we become more aware of our own sin and the death 
depth of our own sin and our need for that divine grace and mercy of God. And uh, the word that we use for this awareness is conviction, that we're under conviction. We understand. Uh, now, we may not have changed our lives. We may not have accepted Christ as Savior and Lord yet, but we're under conviction uh, and an understanding that we have fallen short of the glory of God, that we are sinners in need of his grace. We are convicted by the fact that uh, we are not always who we pretend we are, that we are sinful creatures that who cannot save ourselves but rely upon the grace of God to do that. And, and so we talk about that conviction because there are some people who are aware of these things, but they're not quite ready to, they're not repentant enough, or they're not quite ready to make that step of repentance, of asking for forgiveness, of trying to turn around and make that a uh, new life. Uh, where they are justified or made right. Sometimes that, that move from conviction to repentance is very quick, and I've known people where it took them a long time, they just weren't quite ready yet to give up that control, to acknowledge their sinfulness and to acknowledge God's grace and to really give their lives fully uh, over to Him. But there does come that time if we ask God for forgiveness, the Bible tells us that we are justified, which means we are made right by God and forgiven. Our sin is washed away. God removes us from our sin as far as the east is from the west. God remembers it no more. To be justified means to be made right. And we are justified, though, not through any proclamation of faith, not through anything that we do, but we're justified, we are reconciled, we are forgiven, by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross for our sins. And uh, in talking about this, remember, when I, when, or at least to let you know, when I use the word grace, I'm talking about the free, unmerited, unearned love of God. There's nothing you can do to let, make God love you more. There's nothing you can do to God, make God love you less. All that we have is a gift from God, including our very lives, given to us out of love for us. Um, and you see, it's important to understand that because it's not as if we uh, do certain things and then God offers us his mercy and forgiveness and God says, okay, you've got to do this, 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 and this, and then I will forgive you. No, God through Jesus Christ has forgiven us. He forgave us there on the cross. The question is whether or not we're going to receive that and accept that. And, and, and we have to, in our own lives and hearts, we have to acknowledge what Christ did for us, the need that, that we have because we are sinners, uh, saved by the grace of God. And that need for the saving grace of Jesus Christ, to accept that and set, accept Jesus as our Savior and our Lord. And we believe that it is the work of the Holy Spirit working in our lives even before a point of awareness and then working to bring us to that point of realization, of conviction, and then, then that point of acceptance, that point of salvation. Uh, to understand what it is that he's done. That's the work that as Christ was calling people to be part of the kingdom of God, as Christ was calling people to account in his earthly ministry, and as Christ was performing and reminding people, and performing miracles and healings and reminding people and demonstrating uh, God's love, the love of the Father, the Spirit is doing that in our lives uh, today, calling us to repentance and reminding us that we, in Christ we are forgiven that Christ did uh, accomplish that, that reconciliation there on the cross. And so the question is whether or not are we going to accept that? Are we going to accept God's grace? Are we going to accept what it is that God has done to us? The Spirit, I believe, is the one who is prompting us. The Spirit is that little voice that's speaking to us in the back of our heads. I say, I tell uh, in my confirmation class that the, that the Spirit is, when we're talking about our conscience, let your conscience be your guide, that that's the Holy Spirit that is speaking to us, telling us how God wants us to think and to uh, be. And the beautiful thing is, is that once we accept Christ as Savior and Lord, it's not as if God says, okay, you're now on the fold, you're good, have fun, you're off on your own. No, God continues to work through the Holy Spirit to bring us to that deeper relationship of life, to continue to transform our hearts, to continue to make of us a new creation, to help us see creation in a new way, to root out those parts of our lives that we may not have yet turned over to God, to live fully in accordance with the will of God. And in our Wesleyan tradition, we call that sanctifying or perfecting grace, where by God, by God through the Holy Spirit continues to root out sin and continues to, to dwell more fully in our hearts to where our lives are a continual living testimony to what God has 
God has done in our lives. And it's a beautiful thing, uh, I think, to think about the fact that we continually uh, grow in that love of God and, and, and through all eternity we continue to, to take those steps to experience and to be open in receiving the full measure of God's love and grow in our knowledge and our understanding of the nature of God as, as the Spirit of God um, inhabits and dwells in our lives. Um, and actually, it's kind of one of the hallmarks of Wesleyan theology we practice in the United Methodist Church is that, that idea of sanctification, that idea of perfection, that idea of grace. Not that we never mess up or never do anything wrong, but that God is continually doing that work to perfect us, to make us more holy uh, in his sight, to live holy lives, and that hopefully tomorrow we have a closer relationship with God than we do today. And even if there are ups and downs that we still, over the course of time, we grow and we have a deeper relationship with God than we uh, did last week or last year or uh, turn or, or ten uh, years ago. Uh, there is in Matthew five forty eight. Jesus says, "Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect." And by perfection, he doesn't mean that we never sin, but that the love of God fully occupies our hearts. That we desire nothing other than to please God and to love God as God calls us to love. Where there is no deceit. Um, those parts that there's no, no part of our hearts, no part of our lives, no part of our minds that we keep from God, that we truly strive to love uh, God and to love our neighbor fully. And we um, and that if there's somebody that maybe has been opposed to us, has been causing us harm, and they kind of get their come up and so they, they get what's coming to them or they're paying for their raise and whatever phrase those things is, instead of having that secret satisfaction that they got something coming to them, there's that grief and sadness because another person has fallen so far short that our lives are, are, are moved by that, that we are quick to forgive and to understand the depth of God's forgiveness in our own lives. That we can say that we truly desire to serve only God and that we, are, that we rid ourselves of bitterness and wrath and anger. So none of us may be there yet, although I do know some people who are closer than others. But the sanctifying, perfecting grace of God is that through the Holy Spirit, God continues to do his work in our lives and in the world, reminding us of the depth of his grace and love, transforming us and renewing us and drawing us closer to him daily. The work of, the, of sanctification, the work of prevenient grace and the work of justifying and convicting grace and the work of sanctifying grace is the work of the Holy Spirit whereby we grow in that relationship with God. We trust him more and more. We love him more and more. We love our neighbor as ourselves. And, and one of the things that I find exciting is that that is a continual work that we do throughout um, our lives and really throughout all eternity. I think that because God is so so deep and so vast that we continue to plumb, we never fully understand and never um, fully uh, can uh, uh, can comprehend uh, the, the magnitude of who God is. But as we walk with him daily and as we spend that eternity with him, we continue to plumb the depths of God's nature. And as the more and more we are aware of God's grace, the more and more we're aware of the depth of our own sin that God has forgiven us of, which means that we become more and more aware of the depth of God's grace. And it continues to do that. Uh, there's a, a hymn in our United Methodist hymnal that just says, Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. What a joy. What a comfort to know. And it's the Holy Spirit who offers us these things. In John 10, Jesus says that he came that we might have life and have it abundantly. And I think that is the work of the Spirit to give us that abundant life. So in our journey of faith, as we go throughout our lives and we have this prevenient grace of God working through the Holy Spirit to bring us to that full awareness of the depth of God's love and mercy, we have that point of conviction and then that point of justification where we 
accept what it is that God has done for us through Jesus Christ and we receive Christ as our Savior and Lord and the Holy Spirit then comes in and inhabits our lives and as the Spirit comes in and inhabits our lives from that point of salvation, the Spirit continually uh, works and transforms us uh, day by day. The Spirit gives us those spiritual gifts. The Spirit gives us opportunities to follow Him and to serve Him and guides us in that deeper relationship uh, with God throughout our life. And the beauty of it is that any person can accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. There is no one who is so old or so bad or so anything that they cannot receive salvation in Christ. I've pastored those folks over the years who uh, who had wanted to have nothing to do with God and yet later in their life they had this they came to this understanding. Sometimes it was a health event. Sometimes it was a conflict. It, sometimes it was just a weariness of trying to carry that, that burden of self-centeredness all their lives. And they gave their lives over to Christ. And they experienced a joy and a peace in their later lives and a, and, a, and a joy and service in their later lives that they did not know before that. But God used them to, tra to transform, uh, to, to be a witness to other people. And God used them in mighty, mighty ways. All of us, whether we are relatively new Christians or we've been Christians most of our lives, have lapsed here and there. Um, and, um, and, and, but all of us need to be open to the work of the Spirit because we've also had those points of great faithfulness as well. We need to be open to the work of the Spirit to guide us and to strengthen us. We are never too old or too good to learn, continually learn from the Spirit. I want to transition just a little bit and talk about some of the roles of the Spirit that we see there in Scripture as well. The Holy Spirit is our God. And by the word God, I mean a couple of different things. One is that the Holy Spirit is our God in terms of conscious. And I talked about that just a minute ago. And particularly in talking with, with students in confirmation classes and teenagers, that to think about the conscience as the Holy Spirit that is speaking to us, you, that uh, helping us understand first, excuse me, first and foremost what is right and wrong, then by the strength and power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, enabling us to do what is right and to refrain from sin. When we pray about what it is we are to do, what's the right thing to do? Where's God leading me here and where's God leading me there? We, we, we will take, say these things. What's one of the phrases that people use sometimes? I felt led by the Holy Spirit to do that. It meant that that person was saying and praying to God, God, what would you have me do? Where would you have me go? Who would you have me witness to? What area of service would you have me fulfill? That it was seeking the will and guidance of God through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit guides us where it is that God needs us to go. And we see that in, in the, uh, the book of Acts, where there were places that said that Paul was going to try to go, and it said the Spirit prevented him from do that. Acts 16, verses 5 through 8, shows Paul going to certain places and not going to certain places, it says, because he was forbidden by the Spirit. Paul had expressed throughout his ministry um, a strong desire to go to Rome, but, but would uh, over and over again would understand that it wasn't time for him to go to Rome. And in fact, the time that by the time the Spirit uh, told him now was the time to go to Rome, it was near the end of his life. And so Paul was obedient to the will of God and obedient to listening to the guidance of the Spirit of where he should go. And also, though, you see, where he should not go. Because sometimes the things we're not supposed to do are just as important or more important than the things we are called to do. So this guiding and leading of the Holy Spirit may or may not be as direct as it has been in the times of Paul, as it was in the time of Paul, or as it was with Paul. I can say in my own life that I've had those times where it was very, very clear, and there was no doubt, and while I didn't hear an audible voice, I might as well, because it was that crystal clear to me. I've had others where I have, where I've been less certain, and I just had to go with where I had that peace in, in my own heart, and I still wasn't sure up here what I ought to do. But I, but I knew that, that if I was going to have peace in my heart, I needed to go in a particular direction. And I believe that's the guidance of the Spirit as well. Sometimes very clear cut. Sometimes it's a little more, uh, it's a little less so. 
Uh, but whenever I've sought to, to seek first and foremost the will of God and to follow the guidance of the Holy Spirit, God's never, ever let me down. The Holy Spirit as our advocate and comforter and intercessor. In John 14, verses 16 through 17, and in John 14, 26 to 27, he says that when I leave, the Holy Spirit will come, and he uses that word advocate. You know, an advocate is somebody who's working on your behalf. It's the intermediary who presents your case um, on, on your behalf. Um, an advocate, as I like to put it, is pro-you. They're in your corner. They're fighting for you. And so think about this. The Holy Spirit, who's been present from the very beginning, who's co-eternal with the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit is on your side. The Holy Spirit is working and interceding for you. And so you know that your life, that our life, when we know that our lives are secure in the arms of God, that our lives are secure, that no matter what happens in this life, that we know we have that assurance of salvation, we have that assurance of God's love, that assurance of that eternal life uh, with him when, as we are seeking uh, to do that. Because we know that the advocate is on our side and wants us to experience, as Christ said, that full and abundant life. The advocate intercedes for us. It's the person who maybe when we've gotten in trouble, the advocate says, I've got this. I'm going to be there for you. So the advocate intercedes for us between us and God. That advocate, that intercessor, that comforter is seen in a powerful way through Romans 8, 26, where it talks about when we don't know how to pray and the spirit intercedes for us in our weakness. And when we don't know how to pray, the spirit intercedes and, and prays for us with, with sighs or groans too deep for words. In other words, so when our limited understanding of language fails us, when we're so jumbled up in, in mind and heart that we can't even really articulate, we can't write it down, we can't articulate it in our lives, and, and we just don't know what to do, then the Spirit is there interceding for us. I saw a great Facebook meme that said uh, that showed this picture and it said dear god and then it shows just all these squiggly lines just going all over the place of the page and going all the way down to the bottom and then it just says amen i bet you have felt like that before and if not you'll have a period of time where you feel like that and yet we know that the spirit is there for us our advocate interceding for us with sighs and groans too deep for words even when and especially when we have no words and no words will come or our, our minds and spirits are so jumbled up we don't even know how to pray. To know that God is working for us in that manner um, is just an amazing thing to me. And that's why Paul in Romans 8 writes so powerful and he even says confidently later on that nothing can separate us from the love of God. One other aspect of the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit is the giver of gifts. And I want to say just a, a spiritual gift. Let me say just a quick word about the difference between spiritual gifts and then other talents and abilities. I like the definition, so I'm borrowing it from a book called Serving from the Heart. It's a study on the spiritual gifts that put out, I believe, by Abington or by Cokesbury. Um, and this is the, the definition. Spiritual gifts are divine abilities given to every Christian by the grace of God through the Holy Spirit to be used to serve and strengthen one another and to glorify God. I like that. They are gifts that come from God through the Holy Spirit by God's grace to be used in the service of God to strengthen one another and to glorify God. Now, how is that different from talents and abilities? Well, talents and abilities are just kind of natural things, uh, gifts that are given to each person. We kind of inherit them from birth. There are just certain things we're better at than others. Um, I, I've, I've never been I'm good with my hands. I've never been uh, good mechanically with things. I'm not a fix-it type of person. But from the earliest point, uh, singing in singing in kids' choir, in in church, music came naturally. I just heard it. I could pick things up quickly, even though and when and and all those things that just came. And even when I worked really hard at it, and I got a lot better at singing, or I got a lot better at reading music, or when I played trumpet more, and doing all those things, and I improved, and I utilized and and increased that skill. 
it still came just a lot easier to me than it did to some other people, whereas you would never want me to try to fix anything uh, there around the house. Another difference between spiritual gifts and talents and abilities is that spiritual gifts are always used for the edification and the glory of God, serving God, and especially serving God through the church. Talents and abilities can, can be used that way, but they are also used for self-edification, lifting oneself up, benefiting oneself. And I don't necessarily mean that in a negative way, um, uh, although it can be used in a negative way. Um, but I played, I played the trumpet since I was 12 years old. And, and I played it to bring enjoyment to others. I played it to bring uh, in, in service to God. I've played numerous, many, too many times to count where I played into the church. But you see, I also played that trumpet for my own benefit because I enjoyed playing trumpet. I played trumpet to earn scholarships and to earn money. I used it, I'm a very competitive person for me. Playing trumpet was an avenue to kind of scratch that itch of, of competition. So none of those things were necessarily negative, but I used them to benefit me, to help me, to, to bring me enjoyment and fulfillment. Spiritual gifts, by contrast, are giving, given not to every single person, but only to Christians. Those spiritual gifts that we get when, when we accept Christ as Savior and Lord. And the spiritual gifts are for the sole purpose of edifying and serving God and glorifying God uh, through God's church and in God's name. The Spirit, Paul says, gives these spiritual gifts to each Christian in the manner, the measure, and the number in which the Spirit chooses. So you see, we don't get to decide what spiritual gifts we have, but we are to trust the wisdom of the Spirit who gives them to us, who joins us together in the body of Christ, who intends for us to use them in service to God's church for God's glory, individually in our lives and also then through the church. Now, I'm not going to go through all the different gifts, but there are several mentioned, especially in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. Another thing that's interesting about gifts versus talents and abilities is that these spiritual gifts are all done in the context of relationships. Again, if I think about a talent and ability such as playing trumpet, I can do that for myself and I can use it to benefit myself. I could come and pick up the trumpet and play and enjoy it myself just for me. By contrast, again, the spiritual gifts are always used in relationship, in relationship with God, in relationship with the church, in relationship to serving other uh, people. Uh, they are meant to be used as an avenue of witnessing to the power and the glory of God and to the building up of God's kingdom. They're not in any shape or fashion for our own personal benefit. So um, uh, let me, I'm going to just kind of stop there. I, I wish I had more time to go into some of the individual gifts that God gives us, but I encourage you to go and read them in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12. Maybe look up some, or another avenue would be to go look at uh, the, the lessons there on that, on that study that I've done on the Holy Spirit and, and learn more about the Holy Spirit that way. And if you specifically want to look at some of the different spiritual gifts, that's in Lesson 5 of that series. So as we wrap up this lesson, just a couple of reminders and definitions. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is individual and also corporate. An individual, distinct person, but also one with the Father and with the Son. And the Spirit works in perfect harmony and unity with the Father and the Son. The Holy Spirit has been present and active from the very beginning. The Spirit, like the Father and the Son, always has been and always will be. Though the Spirit has operated in different ways throughout human history, since Pentecost, we look to the constant activity and presence of the Holy Spirit as the Spirit dwells in our lives and inhabits us fully as we proclaim Jesus as Savior and Lord. The Holy Spirit is intimately involved in that process of conversion and salvation and making of us a new creation. From the very beginning of our existence, before we're even aware of God uh, through and, and what we experience, would, would term God's prevenient grace through the convicting and justifying and then after that point of salvation the sanctifying grace of God the work the Holy Spirit works in our lives in a variety of different ways and by no means did I mean all this to be comprehensive it's just it would take too long but some of the more common roles that we see are advocate uh, comforter guide leader intercessor and giver of spiritual gifts our call with the Holy Spirit is to be open to the movement of the Holy Spirit in our lives 
and in this world the way that God is working in this world and in our lives so that we can live lives full of glory to God so that we can serve others in the name of Christ and do that by the power of the Holy Spirit. I hope that this has been helpful. In the, in the fifth lesson, which will be the last one on the Apostles' Creed, I'll look at the uh, what I would call concluding statements uh, that go from uh, the Holy Catholic Church all the way uh, down to, to the end and covers a variety of different points, and we'll look at each one of those individually. Thank you for joining me today in this lesson. I hope that it's been helpful to you. Uh, I hope that you have a wonderful day in the Lord. Thank you, and God bless.